Welcome to Behind the Seams, a transparent look into the world of fashion. Hosted by Anne Price, Emily Burns, and Michaela Albright. One of our greatest issues in society today is our surplus of goods. Americans are notorious for excess. We don't need 15 white t-shirts, but we still own them. Why do we feel the need to own them? To purchase in bulk, to fill our closets and drawers to the brim. Ask yourself, that's what we did. Did we always have this empty void that needed to be filled, or was the void carved out for us? The chicken or the egg is often a question asked in terms of which came first. What we're wondering is if the fashion industry created the supply to fill the demand, or if the demand was created to fill the supply. Have consumers created the machine that is fast fashion, or does the industry want us to believe that? First, we have Radley Kramer, director of the fashion program, addressing this idea of which is to blame, and summarizing the current state of these issues. It's sort of the chicken or the egg, which started first. It, it wasn't Fashion is really just responding to what consumers want. And fashion is an industry that wants to make money. So they're going to give the consumer whatever they're asking for. So the consumer now is asking for fast fashion. So that is the big uh, disruptive um, impact on the industry. So everything has been sped up. So consumption also goes up in that situation. The other thing is that um, big retailers have driven down. It is their responsibility because they're serving their uh, board of trustee members by, um, or their board of directors by wanting to make the greatest profit possible. This profit-driven industry is one that does not often take into account the externalized costs of fashion. The pace of fashion also affects the pace of production, consumption, and spending. As a direct result, we are seeing rampant changes within our economy. The emphasis is placed on the short term, devaluing long-term stability and our future. The introduction of sustainable fashion calls for a need to redesign this economic model. People often turn to the idea of supporting the secondary market to avoid fueling these issues. Next, we have Jackie Shaquine, Associate Editor of Retail Intelligence at WGSN, followed by Dr. Ann Davis, Associate Professor of Economics, Chair of Economics, Accounting, and Finance, introducing the involvement of the economy. We could see the rise of like third-party markets for resale. Um, there's tons of apps for reselling designer or even fast fashion clothes, so there, there could be more of a trade economy that could develop. Um, more people might buy used clothes, um, you know, thrift or vintage, which really goes along with like the sort of um, very individualized identities that I think like Gen Z and even younger are going to have. What I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to inspire and we're trying to inspire, I think, in our listeners is just awareness where they are like, oh, wow, you know, maybe I'm not going to go shopping at the gallery and support all these fast fashion brands. And, like, we hope to inspire kind of, like, a non-consumption at those brands. And maybe those consumers will go on to purchase from, you know, B Corps or more sustainable um, companies because there are a lot that are emerging. Do you think that, like, this consumer demand and this consumer consciousness could, like, a company could realize, oh, you know, there's no more, like, there's not enough demand, you know, our profits are going down, we got to switch. Um, yes, and, and then vintage clothes, people reusing, which becomes fashionable, hey, that was totally taboo. Use clothes, oh my goodness, that's for poor people. Um, so yes, I think it will help. <clears throat> but when you say, I'm not buying because I don't need, because I'm going to reuse, that hurts the economy in the short run. Consumer, I mean, the companies can't sell their products, and, it hurts, and they lay off workers, right? And so, in other words, there is a transition. And if the transition doesn't happen in some kind of coordinated way, it's harmful in the short run. We lose our jobs. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so, saying, I'm not going to buy this anymore, is a powerful, you know, consumer boycotts can be very powerful if they're widespread and unified. But in the short run, it hurts the economy. 
The idea of a slow economy is a potential solution to our overproduction and overconsumption of goods. It creates an alternative to boycotting new purchases or solely supporting the secondary market. As we re-emphasize the importance of future durability, the need to meet tomorrow's quotas fade into the background. If design, production, and consumption slow to a manageable pace, we can increase the quality and lifespan of not only our clothes, but of our planet and ourselves. What are some of the problems with the slow economy? Things cost more, but and then you have to keep things longer. But you might have a real job, and you might not have to be so obsessed on getting the latest thing and spend more time doing things that help your local community, either employment or environment, like go volunteer in a natural national park or something. You know, so so I think if we get off our consumer kick, we might also have time to spend more friends and family and also protecting the environment as well as enjoying it. And, and so it's almost like how do you live your life and what's important to you? And, and that may mean a really important shift away from consumerism into the um, best things in life are free. You've heard that. But we don't believe that anymore. Will this shift away from consumerism damage the economy? I think it'll... Well... It's not necessary, but right now, 75% of our economy is consumer sector. And so, but we have underinvestment in roads and bridges and schools, right? And, and so we could spend a little bit more on public good, which right now is taboo because you can't tax anybody because they'll leave the country. But if we could tax corporations, they're sitting on cash piles that they're not spending, except on campaigns. <laughs> So if you could tax a corporation, you could have some public goods, and maybe that would then bring people back into an appreciation of what those public goods are. So we really have quite a distorted economy, and shifting it back would take massive effort. It's definitely an investment that's going to maybe hurt at first, and I, I think what might happen, maybe one of the big fast fashion brands will make steps towards it, and that will kind of put some pressure on the other ones to change how they do things, and eventually, um, the, it, like, in, incredibly wasteful manufacturing pro- processes will just, you know, be a thing of the past. At this point, you may be asking yourself, why haven't these steps been taken to redesign the manufacturing processes? Dr. Thomas Lynch, Associate Professor of Environmental Science, speaks to this, followed by Jackie Shaquine. I mean, the technology is pretty much already there, so it's, it's not like we have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, it, it's just, um, you know, finding the will to, to use them. So, I mean, you can take pretty much any wastewater and using existing technologies, I mean, you can turn it into drinkable water. Well, I mean, the, the easy answer is money. You know, that's that's the the easy answer for any, how does anything change, is it has to, you know, be a change to their source of income. And it's hard, you know, we see that in, even with, like, renewable energy and in the, with the government, you know, they don't, they could invest in solar or wind power, but we make more money off of oil, um, so I think it's going to take big pushes and maybe even in industry pressure to change manufacturing processes. But honestly, like until people really believe that they can change the way they're making money, I don't think things are going to change that much. In order to change the way the industry makes money, we need to teach the consumer to want something different. There is power in the way goods are marketed towards consumers. If we emphasize an asset other than a cheap price or deep assortment, we have the ability to seamlessly enter sustainable fashion into their minds. Richard Kramer, Senior Professional Lecturer of Design and Merchandising, touches upon the power of the marketing industry. Look, the fashion industry only manufactures, okay? 
But there are a whole great group of other people who are involved in the industry, which I think need to be taken into account, and they are also accountable. Look, a designer designs something, it gets out in the market, it either sells or it doesn't sell. But the people who are behind it, let's say the advertising industry, is very much culpable and responsible for the way we view modern fashion and the way the consumer buys. Patagonia, for example, all right, they come out with an ad, don't buy this jacket, okay? And all of a sudden you go like, oh, that is so anti-advertising, yet that's so embracing to your public to say, yeah, if your old Patagonia jacket is still usable, use it. Send it back to us. We'll repair it. You know, I, I think this is where the American public is very skewed. You know, in Europe, it's a very different thing. In Europe, you tend to buy, or people who have the means, and that not everybody does, but even people who don't tend to look this way. You know, if you want a nice jacket, you go out and buy the most jacket you can get for your money, okay? And you wear it for years, okay? And this is part of the thing which the uh, American people need to understand, you know, that if you're going to buy, buy quality, buy simple style, don't buy fancy because fancy always goes down the drain. Not only does it go out of fashion, it also rips and tears and is hard to maintain. All right, so these are the things which I think the American people have to become aware of. I'm not sure how we do that other than with companies like Patagonia or, uh, and there are many others, of course. I, I think Patagonia sticks in my mind because they were one of the first in the industry to uh, use that kind of approach to their consumer. Patagonia is one of the first companies to step away from fast fashion and rampant production and move towards innovation in production by utilizing recycled material. Buying things of quality may appear more expensive, but only because we have been convinced that cheap, unreasonable prices are of the norm. Here we have Radley Kramer on the topic of fast fashion, followed by Sonia Roy, Senior Professional Lecturer of Fashion Design and Merchandising. Yeah, if you add up all the money that you spend, the the average consumer who is a fast fashion consumer spends, then it really doesn't take long to uh, have enough to buy something that's going to be a lasting product. I think the industry has done a lot to train us to not expect quality. Um, because it's, it's hard to find, right? It's hard to find for a reason. Like I said, they, before they, they figured out a long time ago that... Because marketing always has to do with telling us that we're missing something, right? And one of the things we're missing is a lot of stuff, right? So much of it has to do with, um, look, look at this. You can get this in 10 colors. Why do you need it in 10 colors? But somebody's telling us we need it in 10 colors, right? So I think everybody's played um, a part in it. We've been lazy, and we've bought into what they've told us about ourselves, so I don't, I don't know who's to blame. I think everybody's he's got some, uh, you know, some blame in it. And, and, you know, even people who will tell you that, you know, they hate the fashion industry and they hate fashion, fashion's not important. Unless they're standing in front of you buck naked, they're engaging in that process. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they tell you. Jennifer Finn, affiliate professional lecturer of fashion merchandising on the subject. You know, it kind of comes back to I when I teach in Principles of Retailing, where we say marketing is so connected to the value that one person feels, um, and that is such a subjective term, because what is valuable to you is not as valuable to you, and it's the difference between the needs and wants. Because as human nature, we always want to have that feeling of wanting something, versus, and then it becomes, as a job, as a, my job as a retailer, is to change that want into a need that's there is it yes about obviously a, a revenue generating sales dollar but there's also that's where we use the expression that total retail experience 
because there is a connection when someone feels really good about something that they purchased. And I don't necessarily even mean apparel. It could be something for their home, a decorative painting, that if we've convinced you that you have to have this and then you feel really good when you buy it, it does do something for your psyche. So it is, there is definitely obviously a capitalist sense that's driving, driving that, but there also is really comes down to the values and, and what is important to that individual. What's interesting to say is H&M, the CEO, they have, you know, H&M Conscious, which is a big part of their brand, mm -hmm. but they're also a fast fashion company. And the CEO says, you know, I don't think that consumers are ready to pay $40 for a t-shirt or $100 for a pair of sustainable jeans. Um, do you think that it's, it's a combination of both consumer and business kind of just raising the price level and the quality? Or do you think it's really going to come from consumer demand? It's a little of both. Um, because I think there's always the person that would like to. It's the same person that would love to buy organic and love to shop local. But then at the end of the day, when they're looking at their budget, says, I can't afford to do that. So I think there's going to, as we get better at being sustainable, where industry can offer them, but not at a price point that's so high, then that the levels on both sides will end up matching. I feel like sustainable fashion can be this kind of concept that we can introduce at a subconscious level, almost like we learned in Principles of Marketing, this frog in pot example, where if you put a frog in a pot of boiling water, it's immediately going to jump out because it senses danger, it senses a change. But if you put the frog in the pot of water first and then let the pot boil over time, it slowly happens and it doesn't realize that it's happening to it until it's too late. I feel like we can use that with sustainable fashion because consumers aren't going to just change overnight. And I feel like we see this slow movement towards sustainable fashion, like I was saying in Jennifer Finn's interview um, about H&M. You know, they're slowly integrating sustainability into their business. You know, they have their conscious line, like I was saying. Um, they have their Recycle Week initiatives. Um, but but fundamentally, although they're making these these steps, these incremental steps, I mean, fundamentally, their system is is fast fashion. So they're trying to push volume. They're trying to constantly have deliveries that are satisfying customers that are buying things every two weeks. And so fundamentally, although this is good, the system of fast fashion needs to change, not simply saying, keep on buying, keep on buying, but give us back it in two weeks and just keep on buying more. Right, and kind of going with that innovation, um, the point of sustainable fashion is that it becomes fundamentally a part of fashion. It's not like there's fashion and there's sustainable fashion. It needs to be completely integrated to the point where, you know, in the next couple of decades, it's not even a question of whether or not something is sustainable. It's just assumed because this is fashion. It's ethical, it respects the environment, and it's also gorgeous. People want to buy it. It looks amazing. It's cool. And that's really the whole point of all of this. You know, that's how the fashion industry is going to continue to thrive. Exactly. This, this sustainability is, is not a trend. It's not going to leave. It's, it needs to be fundamentally integrated into the system. Radley Kramer. The hardest part is because students have been trained to like fast fashion. I hear students say things like, oh... I already took an Instagram shot in this outfit. I don't want to repeat that outfit again. Um, so it's really a confused uh, ethic, in my opinion. Um, it's budgetary in many cases because students have a very limited budget. They, they still want the things that have been socially promoted as um, almost like self-branding uh, items. So... Uh, people want to look fashionable, um, but it takes a while for the student and some, some good reading. Um, one book that, that we frequently cover, even in the first year, is The High Cost of Fast Fashion, which really brings it home that, you know, the average American um, contributes 68 pounds of used clothing to the environment, and most of it ends up in landfills because it's not of good enough quality to even sell to a secondary market. So once people start to realize that, it's, it's something that's sort of hidden from us as consumers, so I don't blame the students for that because 
it's not widely promoted. Um, I think our media has failed us uh, socially in not bringing more attention to that. Once people understand that it is their responsibility, their personal responsibility, to, um, to safeguard the environment and also protect the human rights of other people, then there's a huge um, shift in mindset, and then progress starts to get made. This shift in mindset will reflect in both the consumer and the industry. Like any great undertaking, it will not and cannot happen overnight. However, the impact of one party will affect that of the other. Jackie Shaquine, Sonia Roy, and Jennifer Finn discuss this transitional phase. What's going to happen isn't that people will decide to overhaul their lifestyles and to spend less money, even though they are, which has a lot to do with the economy. But people are spending less money. But I think that the retail industry is going to change a lot first, sort of just as a... It's almost like peer pressure, you know, when one company starts to feel the sort of industry guilt about, you know, they have customer response that's so um, negative towards certain things that they do, and one company changes their environmental or labor practices, and then, you know, all the other ones kind of follow suit because nobody wants to be left in the, in the dust. One of the best ways to do it is to shock people. People think, you know, well, you know, if I just wear, you know, eco-friendly fabric, that's enough. It's not enough. There are entire rivers that are running red right now, species that are disappearing, and it's solely because of the fashion industry, because of our use of cotton or because of our dyeing techniques um, or these large-scale manufacturing plants. And I think until you shock people, people always find, like, little ways, those little convenient ways. You know, it, it, it's an issue um, that people will try to handle or try to mitigate, but in little small steps because that's convenient. But I find that when I look around the classroom and I'm showing these horrific videos, sometimes a little too horrific, but, you know, I warn them this is what's going to happen. With that kind of impact is really what you, you need to shock the pants out of people because people aren't going to get it any other way. From a business perspective, it, it makes perfect sense. I think we're going to get to a standpoint globally that we need to really look at how we use the planet. We've already seen you know, what has happened in our ozone layer, things like that. But I think that the consumer is going to lead us in that business direction that we, as we educate them more and more and we understand the business will need to also meet the needs of the consumer by being sustainable. We feel optimistic that once the industry sees the demand from consumers, it will adapt naturally. Here we have Misty Martin, product developer at Ibex Outdoor Clothing, discussing the effects of consumer influence. The consumer is definitely um, um, interested, like I said, in you know sustainable practices. Um, they're looking at the companies that they're spending their money with. Um, and so this is pushing, you know, the, the industry to, to move forward and innovate. Um, but on the flip side, because the industry understands that um, sustainability has become so important, that they are pushing themselves as well. However, it cannot be left entirely up to the industry to make these changes. Ann Davis follows. Do you think ultimately these changes, these redesigns, or these government regulations are going to come from consumer demand or from, you know, an industry lead and push realizing? Well, it could be both. And it may need to be both, because if a company does it by itself, it won't have any customers, and if the customers do it by itself, then you're just going to have to go home and make your own clothes, which is okay, right? I know people who make their own clothes, but they want to be like the Amish. And they look like the Amish. You know, it seriously friends at Bass are a family where they make their own clothes. It's not so bad. It's actually fun. So it could be that make your own and be sustainable, say in your generation, takes off. And then the companies who want to please and sell things to your generation say, well, I have to do it this way. And then it's up to you to do the research. Are they just greenwashing or... Are they really changing the model? And I, I personally think it's going to need some kind of international standards before we move that far. 
We cannot forget the makers of the policies that production processes have to follow. The government is a viable link between ethical, humane, and reasonable production processes of the industry. Dr. Michael Panzer, African historian, and Dr. Richard Fellman, associate professor of environmental science, speak more to the government's role. It's that, what society do you want to be, right? And so if you're familiar with, and this is just an example, if you're familiar with the Christmas Carol story, right, it's not a religious reference, but if you're familiar with the Ebenezer Scrooge thing, do you want to be the pre-ghost Ebenezer Scrooge or the post-ghost? Who do you want to be? Right, because if you think about this, and it's not because you, all the redemption narrative of Westerners like finally come to their senses, there's part of that. But maybe what shakes them to their senses is the fact that the revolutions are brewing. And if you think about the Christmas Carol story, written in 1843, the Industrial Revolution is going on. You have all the lower classes who are being abused by rich fat cats, and it takes a very tumultuous event in the life of that that person to come to his senses about the greater good for humanity. Right, and I think he you know, is emblematic that a lot of people are just happy with sort of like, well, that's just the way it is. There are winners and losers in the sort of bifurcated world of that, right? That the West is the winners and everybody else is not. Um, and they sort of accept that narrative. But when they don't see it in their own country, they don't see a middle class here and what's happening to jobs, then it's easy to blame politicians. Well, politicians should do something because it's really the corporations that are creating a lot of the seeds of animosity in this country. And they're feeling like those, why are people so upset at politicians? Because you know, they don't want to admit it, but the corporations control the politicians. I mean, let's face facts, you know. So unless you ran that in, I mean, we basically sold our souls, you know. And so Ebenezer Scrooge is a great example of this. You know, like, what is that moment? Like, what is our ghost moment? There's a very, there's a very important link here between corporates, corporations and legislators, particularly the U.S. Congress. There's, there's an undeniable power that the corporations have in influencing government policy and it comes down to financing their campaigns and providing them with support and it's it's only gotten worse should the u.s regulate corporations yes they should because if regulations are not willing to cross that moral boundary i'm not sure what can force them to do it and some people see that as totalitarian but i think it's also mostly a moral question of what is the responsibility of government not just to its own citizens but in the age of globalization we are global citizens. We're supposed to be globally minded citizens, right? Um, and people say, what the hell with that? I want my cheap pair or whatever. But at the end of the day, that's a responsibility to talk about sustainability. Like, you want to sustain the future, you want to sustain some hypothetical idea of America as some house on the hill, then to sustain that should not be through the use of force and, and you know, um, promoting those sort of behaviors. You have to allow people to come from the bottom up. And in order to do that, you have to rein in corporations that are taking advantage of those same people. We have responsibility that way. It is the responsibility, damn it, for lots of moral reasons, but also because if by doing that, then you can avoid the revolutions the United States doesn't want to have, but you can promote democratization. You can promote the very thing we claim to stand for versus creating the conditions that foment the lower classes that are thinking about this, right? If it's the Cold War, they're all communists. Where's communism now, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's not about that. It's about, I mean, Marx had a point. The lower classes are being oppressed. And if you want to prevent that sort of scenario where all of a sudden your Nikes go from 200 bucks for a pair to 1,000 bucks per round, I know some shoes are that much money, but if you're going to do that, right, then how do we, as, as, a, as a country that consumes so much, right, we still are influencing events, but at least we're allowing the people to sort of choose it in a way that's more on, of their decision making if we really do value democracy. I think, we, I think we value democracy when it's convenient. Is what it comes the government has the power to improve harmful production processes. However, their involvement with large corporations keeps them from enacting regulations that will cease these methods. Sometimes it has to come down to the underdogs, those who don't realize their power. Consumer advocates outside of the government, that the, the role that's played by non-governmental organizations, by advocacy groups, cannot be underestimated. You know, the civil rights movement, that was outside of the government. And it, it forced the hand of government, and it's, it's still needing to do that. And same thing with the environmental movement. All the major movements, all the major social changes, all the major uh, changes in legislation really were pushed from outside government. You cannot rely upon government to make the change. It, it invariably comes from pressure from people outside the government. Hopefully, though, you have receptive leaders within the government, whether it's powerful congresspeople, senators, the president, uh, a, a secretary within the cabinet of the president. I think the only thing that breaks the cycle, and it's, it's 
tough to hear it, but the only thing that's going to break it is a, a viable revolution in which the lower, I know it's all the rhetoric and ideology aside, but a viable revolution socially and somewhat politically, how it's even more so politically, you, they've got to break that cycle. Because ultimately the state that's in power is preying upon the lower classes and enriching itself at their expense. And so unless you change it, which a lot of people in the Middle East have, well, that's what happened in the Middle East and all these dictatorships, and there is that power vacuum, because in that vacuum, other actors will step in to a certain extent, or right. you run the risk of that. It's like the devil you know you'd rather leave them in power because, from the point of view of the Western world, because as much as we do business with shitty dictators, right, at least there, there are shitty dictators. I hate to put it that bluntly, but let's call it what it is. So the only thing that really changes these, I would say, literally is a revolution. And then revolutions become slavery, people do die. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a horrible reality because you don't want to die, but how do you change the system? You're dying in the chemicals in which you're breathing in all day in a factory. Period. So slow death, or do you want to take a chance and try to change the system from the bottom up? If our efforts are coordinated and vast enough, consumer advocacy has the potential to fight these large corporations and corrupt governmental policies. By joining together, we can force a greater change within an industry that affects us all. Richard Kramer speaks further on the importance of consumer advocacy. And meanwhile, we're having the media tell us, oh, the great American dream, the great American dream. Hey, look, listen, we better wake up from the great American dream because that doesn't exist anymore. And what happened in the 70s with women going into the workplace, with co computers coming online, uh, all of that increase in productivity that the worker was not making was going into the profit for those few people at the top. And that has to be stopped. And there are simple ways to do that. But it takes everybody. It's not just one person going, give me back that, some of your money. It's not that. At this point, our main question is, will bringing consciousness to consumers be enough to change their mindsets and put into action this revolution from the bottom? Dr. Caroline Ryder, associate professor in the School of Management, addresses the potential. Do you think that bringing consciousness to consumers is enough to change their habits? It's enough to change the habits of a lot of consumers, totally. I, I'm not going to say it'll change all aspects of consciousness of all consumers, but I, I definitely think that when you explain things to people in terms that mean something to them emotionally, it, it, people do change their habits. Just think about smoking. Mothers against drunk driving, students against drunk driving. When I was growing up, all the grown-ups drank. They drank like fishes, and then they drove. They did. and. You know, people just kind of accepted it. And then eventually people said, well, wait a minute, why are we accepting that? And then you had these consciousness-raising organizations, and now people feel really different about it. Here is Peter Brickman, senior professional lecturer of fashion merchandising, reacting to the potential behind educating consumers, followed by Jackie Shaquine, Jennifer Finn, and Sonia Roy. If, <laughs> if you mean hitting them with a two-by-four upside the head, yes. But that's what, that's what it has to, yes, yes. When I was growing up, there were advertisements on television um, that were done by a cartoon character. Well, it started out as Smokey the Bear. And you can prevent forest fires was the thing. They were worried about people camping out and starting fires from their campfires and everything. And they had this part of this bear with a park ranger hat and then it turned into yogi the bear uh, a cartoon character and that uh gave people um made people think when they went out into the national parks about conserving what we've had put aside for us is preserving it uh and uh we do that by the way better than any country in the world so i know we can do the other stuff you know nobody has national parks like this country no one that are free and huge and wonderful. So yeah, I think we could I think we could do that, but everybody's got to buy in. And if you're going to make it a law, it's problematic. There's, there are a lot of people who don't like being told what to do. So through education, through what you're doing here, hopefully educating young people, younger than you, about the issues, I think they will come to their own sense about why it's important but they have to see it it's going to be your children 
your children are going to be the ones because they're going to see all of you doing this. They're going to see you being sustainable in every way, and they're going to learn from that. Some people definitely will respond to that, and it's not not just the people who already have, but especially now there's such an obsession with, with wellness and, you know, the slow food movement, the these people that um, they're investing in themselves and, and being a little more conscious of the planet, what they are taking from the planet, what they're putting into their bodies. You know, and that's become like more than a fad. You know, that's really just become how, how a lot of people are. And it could be different here in, in New York and urban areas than it is in middle America. But I think consciousness does work for some people who are willing to listen but you know sort of guilting the consumer doesn't really go it can only go so far because not everyone's going to be an activist another question do you think that bringing consciousness to consumers is enough to change their habits you know for telling them about you know some of the negative impacts that no it's not enough because again you're going to always have that person that says oh i would love to and i feel bad but this is still my budget. And, you know, if it comes down to just being what's socially conscious and then at the end of the day, how, you know, how much money I have to spend on my expenses, it's like the someone that wants to buy, would love to buy a hybrid car, you know, because it's a better for the environment, but it's more expensive. So, you know what, I, this is my budget, this is what I can spend. So I think that just bringing it to their attention is not going to be enough. Part of it is denial, or people who are on high horses saying that they're somehow not part of the machine. They are. We're all part of it. Like I said, unless they're standing in front of you naked and go to work naked every day and go cycling naked, which nobody really wants to do. So they're all part of it. Melissa Halverson, affiliate professional lecturer of fashion merchandising and sustainability on the topic, followed by Jackie Shaquine. Do you think in general, just bringing consciousness to consumers is enough to change their habits, or... No. <laughs> Everybody knows. Like, information is not enough. Um, every... <laughs> it's funny. I um, Years ago, I heard um, Noam Chomsky talk, and he was making fun of that phrase, "truth speak truth to power, um, which you hear a lot in politics. And, and he said... Um, I think they already know the truth. They just don't care. <laughs> and um, so I think that uh, inf- constantly making information available, transparency uh, available, um, is uh, that goes without saying. But we know that informing people is not enough to make them change their behavior. In fact, it in some cases, the worse the information is, the more shutdown people get and the more in denial people get. Um, it has to be active. Information is passive. Uh, you know, you can take it or leave it. Um, there has to be a real reward or a real cost that people feel. And now I think we're seeing brands like Reformation or like Everlane have these more responsible business practices and seeing the, the way that consumers respond to that, you know, and you can't really put the genie in the back in the bottle in terms of once you we've torn back the curtain on how horrible so many of these companies like treat their employees, how much waste they create, how horrible they are for the environment. Um, you know, it's it's there's a lot of consumers. Not everyone's obviously going to become an activist, but um, I think it's it's real change that's going to happen, especially with the younger kids today. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how social media affects their spending necessarily, but they definitely seem to be more conscious of what's going on culturally and less consumed with the idea of you know their appearance. Once a certain level of consciousness is reached for consumers, there is no turning back. Thus, entering the ring of parties held accountable. Once again, Radley Kramer, Jackie Shaquine, and Peter Brickman on the responsibility of future generations. That's a very good question. Who has the ultimate responsibility? And that's everyone. Um, they're, they're, you can't pass the buck on this one. So if you, 
uh, one of the reasons I, I like education very much is because I see a growing awareness among this generation of students, and I'm also fascinated to read about uh, Generation Z. They have a much stronger concern for the environment. They have much more, um, they put a lot of importance in terms of social um, responsibility. Um, so I think once the consumer demands accountability, both from other consumers and from the industry, you'll see some real progress being made. So I am very optimistic. It's becoming less to hold into trends and more, because now, especially young people, you know, have so many places they can go for fashion inspiration. They can look at the fashion show, yes, and they can shop at Zara, but there's also, like, you have access to everything via the Internet. You know, they can look at Tumblr and be inspired by images from any time. So, you know, and it's, um, I think more and more we're going to see young people who feel less interested in these really strict trends that take hold and more interested in creating their own look. And then not necessarily like investing in timeless pieces, but investing in individuality and in quality over, you know, participating in a trend. It's uh, a cooperative effort. People do have to buy into it. And guess what? Your generation is going to do that. It's going to be you. Be because the older generations are not that interested. Trust me. It's sad. You'll convert some of them. My daughter is a big one for sustainability. She buys farm products directly from a farmer. She buys all her fruits and veggies with a group of friends. They have bought the whole production of a, a local farm. Uh, and every every week during the summer, she gets a carton delivered to her front door that has maybe broccoli, cauliflower, peaches, whatever the guy is growing. Um, they're they're getting direct from the farm, no pesticides, no nothing. So there is there are excuse me people out there who are willing to do it. What Peter Brickman is saying is really interesting. You know, he's talking about the food industry and how it's slowly like been being changed, not only by consumers demanding, you know, local goods, um, organic goods, things that they can go to their neighbor or their local farmer and find. Um, and that's like coming from a consumer demand, but also, I mean, there has to be a farm there to provide that. Just like in fashion, there has to be an industry to provide what the consumer wants. So, in a way, what we're seeing here in the food industry, this push towards local, this push towards organic, this push towards eco-friendly, I think that we're going to see in the fashion industry. Right. The food industry, what's so interesting about the slow food movement, as I call it, is that it was really pushed by consumers. It really came out of this consumer advocacy that we're trying to get going within the fashion industry. You know, the food industry would have never change their methods if it weren't for the fact that people started demanding it. Yeah, I think that this generation really, we're so much more aware of everything that involves us. Like whatever we put in our mouth, we think about how that's going to affect us later. And I think that a lot of consumers aren't thinking about the fact that like the skin is the biggest organ on your whole body and you absorb chemicals every single day that you don't know you're absorbing. So I think that really with that awareness, starting with that slow food movement, it will end up progressing into fashion. And going along with this increased awareness about our world and what's happened in the food industry, it's clear. And I mean, as they were saying earlier um, in the interviews we had in this episode, you know, it starts with, with grassroots. It starts with small people demanding something. And if the consumer wants it, somebody has to respond to that, whether it's the government or whether it's the industry. If the industry introduces it, someone else is gonna to respond to it. So really, it's just a matter of who's gonna start asking questions, who's gonna start interrogating the process. Before listening to the next episode of Behind the Scenes, listen to the TED Talk of Sheena Matakin, The Uniform Project, where she discusses the possibilities of reducing consumption and increasing innovation to foster change. Then visit our website at thefold.maris.edu slash behind the scenes and browse the learn more tab to learn about activist movements and the best sustainable companies.
If you're interested in learning more, follow us on Instagram at Behind the Seams Podcast or visit our website at thefold.marist.edu slash behind the seams. For further questions, email us at behind the seams podcast at gmail.com. This episode of Behind the Seams was produced by Anne Price, Mikhail Albright, and myself, Emily Burns. For this episode, we would like to thank our showcase contributors in order of appearance. Radley Kramer, Jackie Shacoin, Dr. Ann Davis, Dr. Thomas Lynch, Richard Kramer, Sonia Roy, Jennifer Finn, Misty Martin, Dr. Michael Panzer, Dr. Richard Feldman, Dr. Caroline Ryder, Peter Brickman, and Melissa Halverson. A special thank you to Wayne Price for the original song, Melissa Halverson for Capstone Advising, and the Marist College Fashion Department and Capstone Advising Committee.